Welcome to Grace Bible Church, and welcome to Equipping Hour. It's good to see you this morning. We're really glad that you are here. My name is Scott Maxwell, and I am the president of Finisterre. Um, and this morning during Equipping Hour, we get a chance to give you a little bit of update of what's going on with Finisterre. There's a lot going on with Finisterre, and it's exciting. So let's, let's open in a word of prayer. And then we will just jump right in today, okay? Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for um, the, the mission that you are carrying out in this world that has come to us here. Somebody had courage and somebody had conviction and somebody had love. And somebody thought you were worthy to be obeyed. And they opened their mouth and they shared the good news of Jesus Christ with us. Maybe it was a mom or a dad or a brother or sister, child, friend, a stranger, a pastor. And Lord, here we sit as trophies of your grace now because you were worthy to be obeyed uh, with the Great Commission. And so, Lord, we're just thankful for that. And we are mindful that there are still just many across this globe who don't even have access uh, to that message. They don't have their... Even their language is not even written down. They don't have an alphabet. That means they don't have a Bible. We take that for granted. We have so many different translations in English that we can benefit from, and they don't even have one. They can't read it. They can't rejoice in your majesty. They can't enjoy your compassion for sinners. They cannot see the awfulness of your wrath towards sinners. They cannot see and understand who your son is and who, um, what he came to do for us at the cross and empty tomb. And so, Lord, we are compelled that you are still worthy to, obey, to be obeyed and to go to the ends of the earth for your namesake. I pray, Lord, that um, you would draw near to each one here this morning, Lord, that they would um, have a renewed sense uh, of conviction in their hearts to be used by you, whatever that means for them, Lord, by the gifting that you've given them, by their maturity, by their availability, Lord, that they would be used by you to bring the gospel to the ends of the earth. Draw near to us now, Lord. We love you and we need you desperately. And we pray in Jesus' name, amen. All right, well, what I want to do this morning is I'm going to give you um, just four parts of my message. Um, number one, I just want to introduce and reintroduce Finisterre to you, because I, not because I don't think you know, but I, I don't want to assume that there, everybody in this room knows what Finisterre is. And so I kind of want to establish a common baseline of understanding, so we'll start there. And then next, I want to talk to you about a question, an answer to a question that I've been working on. Um, why does Finisterre exist? Um, and I've been working on that, giving thought to that. I know why we exist. I like to come back to questions like that. I think they're helpful. And I want to share that with you because it enlivens me. Thirdly, then, I want to give you an update on Finisterre. And I want to do that, though, through the lens of partnerships that have been forming. Um, one of the clearest ways to show you what God has been doing with Finisterre is to highlight the partnerships that he's been forming for us. Uh, we can't, Finisterre cannot carry out its mission alone, um, and we can't carry it out with just a few partners. We actually need a lot of partners um, to be joining arms with us. The, the task is so great in Papua New Guinea, uh, and the, the obstacles to bringing the gospel to unreached language groups are so formidable um, we need to be banded together with as many partners as possible. And so I think it's encouraging to hear um, in update form those partnerships. And then lastly, I just want to share with you the implications that that has on me and on Kim. Uh, forming those partnerships for the success of Finisterre has, has led me to think strategically um, about where I should be as president uh, to best form these strategic alliances for the sake of the gospel in Papua New Guinea. Um, Finisterre needs to be the best sending ministry possible that it can be. And so let's start with just reintroducing Finisterre, shall we? Um, Finis 
Terra, two Latin words put together. Finis meaning the end. Terra meaning the earth. The end of the earth. As in Acts 1.8, when Jesus said, you shall be my witnesses even to the end or the remotest part of the earth. And so we are a missions agency that uh, loves the priority of the local church. Um, We are not at the center of the local church. The church, or at the Great Commission, the church is at the center of the Great Commission. And so what we do is we assist. That's all we do. We assist. We assist the church in sending their missionary church planters and their Bible translators into unreached language groups in one mountain chain in Papua New Guinea. That's the only place we're looking, the only place we are sending and helping churches get there. We we make it easier for churches to send their missionaries to Papua New Guinea, and then we want to make it easier for their missionaries to stay in Papua New Guinea. It's hard to get there, and it's easy to leave, but we want to make it easy to stay. And so that's a way that we can come alongside local churches and help them to do that. And why Papua New Guinea? Why are we focused there? It is the most linguistically diverse place on the planet. And it has great spiritual needs. There are upwards of 300 language groups on that island nation that do not yet have an alphabet. Uh, So therefore they don't read and therefore they don't have the Bible. And 50 of those 300 language groups are in the mountain chain that we're specifically targeting. And that's plenty for a one missions agency, I think, to focus on. And so that's what we're doing. We're not all over the world. Um, We'll let other people target their parts of the world where they're good. But we want to zero in on one particular mountain chain and really go after 50 unreached language groups in our lifetime if we can. We would like to send one new missionary team into a different language group each year for the foreseeable future. That would be ideal. Uh, Because without someone going and learning their language, without somebody giving them an alphabet, and without someone teaching them then how to read, and without somebody preaching the gospel to them, without somebody translating the Bible into their language, without somebody planting the church in their midst, those language groups are going to perish in their darkness. Just like you and I would if if somebody did not bring the gospel to us. These tribes are helicopter access only. Uh, They are the last unreached language groups of the world, and for this very reason, they are that difficult to get to. These are people that are traveling the same way that they have traveled for about 4,000 years, which is by foot or by canoe. And nothing is really going to change that. On the U.S. side, Finisterre has a team together. Um, As I said, I'm the president. Jeremy Lehman is back there. Hi, Jeremy. Jeremy is our COO. He is a trainer. Um, of our missionaries that we get to send and assist in sending, and he is a friend. Cameron Dodd is our director of marketing and communications. She has been there and done it. Um, I have not been there, and I have not done it. And so when I speak, she needs to make my words sound better than they are. And she does that all the time. She helps me greatly. And Amber Baum is an administrative assistant for us on this side, and the four of us get to tackle all things Finisterre on this side. As the president, I get to recruit churches, which is really fun. I get to go talk to pastors. I know how a pastor thinks. I know what a pastor doesn't want to hear from a missions agency, and I know what a pastor would love to hear from a missions agency. And it's fun to be that guy to surprise them and say, I I know what you want to hear, and I want to tell it to you because I believe it. You're the one who is sending your missionary, and I'm not going to overtake them and overflood your missionary. Um, that's really fun to do. I get to build strong relationships with churches and missionary candidates to make sure that we are compatible, um, that we're going to last long-term wise. Um, I get to help train missionary candidates that we're sending. I get to develop strategic partnerships with other missions ministries. I get to figure out how to raise funds for our ministry so that we can keep going. And I've got an amazing board of directors on this side. Smed is one of them, founding director. Um, 
Steve Kovac is a director, and Philip Smith, who's a pastor at Community Baptist Church in Florida, is my third board member. So that's the U.S. side. On the, on the P&G side, we've got a field director named Brian Twombly. You know him, uh, many of you. Uh, they've been there for almost a year now. Um, we sent them. He's our field director in Medang, uh, overseeing our base. Uh, and his primary task in Medang is going to be church planting. Um, because we don't want to miss that opportunity for strengthening the church or church planting in the town of Medang. And it would be great if in 20 years from now, um, we had really no more need to send any more Americans that direction because a church would be so strong in Medang town that pastoral training could take place for New Guinean qualified pastors who could then be sent back into their clans and they could take it the rest of the way. So that's really what we're planning for. And you know that's not a microwavable kind of thing you're going to get quickly. You don't go pick that up through the drive through You hurry up and get started now today because you, you need to see something maybe in 10 years. And that's what Brian's doing. He's plotting and he's learning language and he's doing a good job at that and he's learning culture and his family is thriving there. And so we're so thankful for the Twombly's. Uh, last week, Frank and Jacqueline Ruscio were here, and Smed had them stand up. They are going to be joining the team in uh, July this year, joining the Twombly's over there. And Frank is actually going to be that ever-slippery logistics coordinator that we have not been able to get for a long time. But it isn't, isn't it interesting? I want you to think on this with me. Isn't it interesting that when we put the priority of our ministry in Madang on the local church, not just carrying out logistics for tribal teams, you know, making sure there's supply runs for them. They need that. But when we put the emphasis on church planting and strengthening the church, and we fill that role, the logistics coordinator comes. Um, that's not to be missed, I believe. Frank and Jacqueline are going to take that role on themselves. And there's even um, more who are interested in joining that team in Madang. And without that team in Medang, we can't do what we say we exist to do. Uh, Finister was formed in 2012 and um, assisted Grace Bible Church in sending the very first tribal team to PNG. That team was made up of the Cans and the Dodds, and the Laymans went over with money in their pocket and were told to start a, a field office, and somehow Jeremy did. And we're so thankful that you did, brother. Um, I believe we have our next tribal team to send. I'll talk a little bit more about them uh, later. Um, perhaps we'll be sending them the first part of 2025. So another language group getting another team. Uh, so exciting. So between our field office and new tribal teams, it is possible, I think, uh, that we could be in the next 12 months sending about seven people to Papua New Guinea. Uh, and that is encouraging to my heart after so many years not sending any. Uh, so that's the introduction. Number two, what I want to talk to you about is this question. Why, why do we exist? Why does Finisterre exist? I think it's good for leadership to ask that kind of question periodically. You know, why are we here? Uh, when I stepped into the president's role three years ago, that's what I did is why does Finisterre exist? And I believe after three years of developing partnerships, um, it was time to do it again um, after some period of growth. Um, I liken it to you're standing at the edge of a, of a jungle and you know why you're there and where you need to go. And so you just take out a machete and you just start swinging. And every once in a while, it's good to climb a tree and look and see, are we, yeah, we're still, oh, that, we got to go that way. Okay, so then that just impels you, compels you, it, it motivates you, it fuels you to come back down and pick up the machete and swing again. And so that's what I've done recently. And the answer to the question becomes that fuel and that motivation for you. It has for me. So here's my answer for why does Finister exist? I'll put it up on the screen for you. Here's the answer. The unrivaled king has an unfinished command among unreached language groups. And he is worthy of unwavering obedience to the ends of the earth. That's why we exist. 
because the unrivaled king has an unfinished command among unreached language groups, and he is worthy of unwavering obedience to the ends of the earth. Let's start with that first one. I want you to turn to Matthew 28, to a passage that I know you're very familiar with. You already can say it in your mind, Matthew 28. But do you know what verse 17 says? I want you to look at how verse 17 ends. His disciples proceeded to Galilee. They went to the mountain that Jesus designated. And when they saw him, they worshiped him. But how does it end? Some doubt it. You know, sometimes ministry hands you uncertainties. It hands you doubts. And that is the scene of the Great Commission. What did Jesus' disciples need most in that moment of their uncertainty? What did they need the most? What did they need in their doubt? Well, Jesus is about to lay out um, a world-sized imperative. But what they needed to overcome their doubts, what they needed to overcome their uncertainties was, was not the needs first at the ends of the earth. Jesus will get to that. What they had to see first in all of their doubt and uncertainty was the unrivaled king. Verse 18, and Jesus came up to those doubters and he said to them, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. All of it. He's unrivaled. He has no peers. When you have uncertainty about ministry, when you have doubts about ministry, the cure is first to put your eyes on the unrivaled king and to align your heart and your mind under him, to see him in all of his exalted glory. And when that has happened, whatever comes out of his mouth for you to do, you will be ready because you see him as he is. That's what Jesus is doing. It's brilliant. So the unrivaled king opened his mouth and gave them a command. And you see the command in verse 19. It's primarily this, make disciples of all the nations. There's the world. Make disciples. The way that you're going to do that is by going, by baptizing when they have believed. They need to be called out of their culture they're in. They need to separate from them publicly through profession of faith and repentance in Jesus Christ and the waters of baptism, they're saying, I used to be a part of that animism. I used to be a part of that uh, ancestor worship. I used to be a part of the syncretism where I took old Lutheranism and I, I just put it on the same shelf with my animism and with my ancestor worship. I used to be a part of that. I am no longer a part of that. I want to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ in the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and I want to join this new community that's called the church. They're commanded to do that, and they're commanded to teach them to observe all that Jesus has commanded. I want you to see how Paul understood that command. I want you to go to Acts chapter 14. Turn there with me. Acts 14, verse 21. You're going to hear a lot of the same language and same wording that's in the Great Commission. So how did the apostles who were standing there that day on the mountain in Galilee, how did they hear that great commission? And what did they go do? Paul believed it and he carried it out. He's already going. He's on his first missionary journey in Acts chapter 14, verse 21. How did he make disciples? Well, after they had proclaimed the gospel to that city and made many disciples. See, the way you make disciples is primarily through proclamation of the gospel itself. Not any other way. You proclaim Jesus Christ crucified for forgiveness of sins. Repent and believe and you shall be saved. That's what you proclaim. And they made many disciples. They returned to Lystra, to Iconium, to Antioch. Well, what about the disciples then? How did they teach them? Well, they strengthened the souls of the disciples. They encouraged them to continue in the faith. 
And they said, through many afflictions, we must enter the kingdom of God. So they made many disciples. They strengthened, encouraged them. We're teaching them how to observe all that Jesus commanded. But then notice verse 23. And connected with that, when they had appointed elders for them in every church, having prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord in whom they had believed. So evidently, the command to make disciples that Jesus gave in Acts and Matthew 28 is essentially the command to ultimately plant churches. That's the way the apostles understood it. That's the way the book of Acts explains the Great Commission. That's the command, to go plant churches. In what sense is it unfinished? <clears throat> if you remind yourself back in Acts 28, verse 19, this must be done among all the nations, all of them, not most, all of them. And remember how verse 20 of, of Matthew 28 ends. Jesus said, I will be with you to the end of the age. And we're not at the end of the age yet, and all the nations have not heard. And so it is an unfinished command. So the unrivaled king has an unfinished command, and it is among unreached language groups yet. So looking at our unrivaled king, and who uttered a command that remains undone, I just want to ask you, how does that set with you? He's the unrivaled king. He gave a command and it's not finished. How does that set with you? Unreached language groups still exist. I, I want to explain to you why I think it's better to call them language groups and not just people groups. I think it's better to designate them as language groups because you need to ask yourself the question, do they have the scriptures in their own language? If the answer is no, then they don't have access to anything of what you and I do or what most people do. And therefore, there's reason, I think, to prioritize them. It's not the only kind of missions that can be done and should be done. There's other kinds that are very important to do. But there does need to be a priority given to unreached language groups who do not yet have the scriptures in their own language. Isn't it interesting in Acts chapter 2, when Pentecost happens, that what the Spirit of God did not do is he did not give all of the Jews from all of the different nations the ability to hear and uh, understand Greek or Aramaic. But what he wanted is for all of them to hear the gospel and the great things that Peter was proclaiming about God. He wanted them all to hear it in their own tongue. So we want to go and prioritize those language groups who do not yet have the Bible in their own language. I believe this is the heart of Paul. Go to Romans 15. Romans 15 verse 20. This is what drove Paul. He said in Romans 15, verse 20, and in this way, I make it my ambition to proclaim the gospel, not where Christ was already named, so that I would not build on another man's foundation. But as it is written, they who had no declaration of him shall see, and they who have not heard shall understand. And without the word of God in their language, how shall they really see and understand? So our unrivaled king has an unfinished command. That's enough right there just to motivate us, I think. But then he turns us to the world to look at the world and to see the world. And when we see the scope of it, when we see the magnitude of it, what are we to conclude? Lastly, then, he is worthy of unwavering obedience all the way to the ends of the earth. That means we're simply not going to give up. We're not going to give up. We're not going to quit. We're not going to get distracted by anything else. We're not going to find something easier to do. We're not going to find something better to do because there isn't anything better to do. Matthew 28, 20, how does it end? Behold, I am with you, he says, always, even to the end of the age. He's present with us. He's watching what we're going to do with his command that he gave. 
And he is with us to empower us to go and to carry it out by his spirit. Turn to 3 John chapter 7, not chapter 7. In case you didn't know, 3 John doesn't have chapters. I just wanted to clarify that. What well, has? It has one. 3 John 7, verse 7. Why did the missionaries that John sent out from Ephesus, why did they go out? Tells us. Why did those missionaries go out? They went out for the sake of the lost. Is that what it says? Uh, We need to go to the lost. These things are not pitted against each other, but there is priority. They went out for the sake of the reputation of Jesus Christ. For the sake of the name, that's why they went. They were convinced by who he was and his unrivaled kingliness. And they went out for his sake. Go to Revelation 5, verse 9. The seal judgments are in a scroll. The world is about to be judged They sang a new song, verse 9, worthy, there it is, worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals. Why is he worthy? What's the reason? What qualified him as worthy of this, to opening the seals? He tells us, because you were slain and because you purchased for God with your blood people from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. And you made them to be a kingdom of priests to our God, and they will reign upon the earth. If what qualified him as worthy at the opening of the seal judgments was because he had purchased men and women from every language group, does that not qualify him also as worthy of obedience when he uttered the command after he paid the price at the cross? So, why do we exist? The unrivaled king has an unfinished command among unreached language groups, and he is worthy of unwavering obedience to the ends of the earth. That's why we cannot shut our doors. That's why we will not shut our doors. This is our fuel. This is our motivation for doing what we do. This is what gets us over the hump of any uncertainty that we face. Any doubt that we'll ever come across will be overcome by this Any fear that we have, any discouragement that comes, we'll overcome it. Zach will overcome his loneliness in the tribe without a teammate because of this. He has an unrivaled king who has an unfinished command in his unreached language group, and he is worthy of unwavering obedience. That's what he'll overcome. This is what we'll do when there's helicopter pilot shortages and mechanic shortages. There's not enough to fly and we can't schedule. We're not going to give up then. This is what you do when an earthquake brings down your missionary house or two and you start to rebuild. You just keep going. You don't give up. This is what you do when there's a fuel crisis in Papua New Guinea and you can't get fuel for helicopters. We find another way. We keep pressing. This is why we don't give up. This is why we press on even with hope and with joy. And I want to ask you, what's your part? What are you doing with your life? What do you want to do with your life? Maybe you're not going to be a preacher, but maybe you can turn a wrench and you can, uh, maybe you want to be a mechanic on, for helicopters. We all love what Zach does. Do you know who is in line behind Zach? So Zach can do what he does? Do you know how many people there are? like pilots and mechanics, people sitting at desks, ordering supplies, people at a base, ordering a helicopter to go visit them, bring them supplies. There's a lot of people behind. This is costly, That's, and he is worthy to go. So we've introduced Finisterre. We've talked about why Finisterre exists. I want to give you an update now through the lens um, of the partnerships that we have formed over the months and years. As I said, we can't finish the command of our unrivaled king in unreached language groups in Papua New Guinea. We can't do that alone. 
Uh, the unreached language groups there are just, there's too many of them. And the obstacles that I just kind of rattled off are, are too numerous and too formidable. We, we, we need partners. And I think part of the challenge for Fidestir over the years is, is, is we, we did too much on our own. And so in 10 years, we sent two teams. That's unacceptable. In the next 10 years, we need to send 10 teams. Um, we need partners to do that. I want to start with the, the most foundational partnership first. Um, it's a church called Grace Bible Church. It's you guys. So much has come out of Grace Bible Church. Um, the leadership of Finister has come out of Grace Bible Church. The COO comes out of Grace Bible Church. The director of marketing and communications, she comes out of Grace Bible Church. The administrative assistant comes out of Grace Bible Church. Two out of the three board members come out of Grace Bible Church. The first tribal team that we were able to assist in getting to Papua New Guinea, the Cans, are from Grace Bible Church. This church sent two house building teams to build two houses about 10 years ago. Um, and even though Finister is not a ministry of Grace Bible Church like Build and Wellspring is, um, we are most definitely a ministry greatly blessed by Grace Bible Church. Um, uncommonly blessed. And so we're so thankful for this, for you and for this foundational partnership that we have. I want to tell you about two other partnerships that are really important for us and have been for 10 years, and that is our partnership in PNG with SIL and New Tribes PNG, or Ethnos 360. <clears throat> Again, this is on the PNG side. SIL is a Bible translation ministry that has been in Papua New Guinea for about 70 years now. Um, how do we partner with them? Well, we rent one of their properties from them in Medang. And so we are on their base in Medang, and that is ours to use for our ministry. And we also rely on their aviation arm um, of their ministry, and their helicopter pilots fly us in and out. And so we are absolutely dependent on SIL, and we have a very robust MOU uh, memorandum of Understanding with SIL, a partnership. It's a really sweet partnership. Jeremy laid the groundwork for that. Brian is building on that. And then we also have a partnership with New Tribes Ministries as well over there and with primarily with their aviation arm and sometimes their helicopter pilots are helping us out. Finisterre has not um, had helicopters and most likely we will not have helicopters. I've been discouraged from buying a helicopter by many people, um, and I believe that. I actually do believe that. And so we are trying to work with the existing aviation structure that is in Papua New Guinea, and they're very eager to do that and to work with us for some reason. And so we rely on these essential partnerships. I wanna tell you about two <clears throat> new partnerships, newer ones that have been forming in the last three years, and there are two churches to, to mention. The first is Community Baptist Church in Stewart, Florida. Philip Smith is the pastor there. He is one of my board members, and he is a dear friend. Every time Kim and I go there, um, Philip and Tanya just love Kim and I. Uh, in the last three years, he has just been such a, a dear friend who has cared for my soul very well. And as you know, Brian and Kara Twombly come from that church, and so Community Baptist has given their best to ensure that our base of operations in Medang um, has qualified leadership. And so I know Community Baptist has Madang's best interests in mind. That is so comforting to me that it's not just on me or on Grace Bible Church, but now there's another church that wants to uphold Madang and make sure it doesn't fall through the cracks. There's another church, and that's Faith Bible Church in Spokane, Washington. Uh, Dan Jarms is the pastor there. That church is a master seminary distance location campus, which means that they can train men on their campus much the same way that we train men here on this campus with the Expositor Seminary. And that's the church that Frank and Jacqueline Ruscio come from, who are going to be the logistics coordinator um, there in Medang. And they also have a vested interest now. Uh, one of the best ways to get people to really care about Medang is to send one of their best there. And then they'll want to make sure that it keeps afloat. 
And so we are so thankful for them. And there's actually another couple at that church that is getting ready to um, do their missionary training for tribal ministry. Uh, Their names are Josiah and Taylor Amundsen. And my hope is maybe in two years, they'll be on a team and we'll send them into another language group. This church in Spokane is like a a training factory. (laughs) There's just people coming out, well-qualified, well-trained men and women coming out for missions. Another partnership that's been really important over the last three years is Radius International. Radius International, that is a training ministry for missionary candidates who want to go to unreached language groups. It's it's a nine-month school um, where missionary candidates go and they learn everything that they need to know about what it's going to take to bring the gospel and bring the church and bring the Bible into an unreached language group. Um, I have often used this in my mind, this illustration in my mind of finding a needle in the haystack. Why would you go look for a needle in a haystack if you could go to the needle factory and just take a needle or two off the shelf? That's what I view Radius International to be. They are like-minded brothers. They're like-minded ministry. They love the priority of the local church in the Great Commission. They love the priority of going after unreached language groups. And for some reason, they have, we have gained favor in their eyes, and they love us. And he, Brooks Buser, who's the president, has been a huge encouragement just to me personally. Um, and I can go visit there. We go visit, and we get to visit with students that are there, and we get to recruit them. We get to build a relationship with the staff there. In fact, I think we found two needles off the shelf there uh, who graduated last year, Luke and Krista Donkels. And Elijah and Kaylee Patterson are formally committed with Finisterre right now and are going through training with Jeremy. They're raising funds. They're from two churches in California. And Lord willing, in 12 months, they'll go into the next language group. We'll send them to Medang and we'll get them ready to survey tribes and pick one. Uh, That's a huge answer to prayer. Um, Radius International, very important. Another... um, ministry that we're building currently a a relationship with is one called JARS, J-A-A-R-S, JARS. It stands for Jungle Aviation, and that should probably say it all for you right there, Jungle Aviation and Relay Service. They're out of North Carolina. Their goal is to remove the barriers or overcome the barriers that keep the word of God from getting into unreached language groups. And they do that by helicoptering in or flying in or sending in on a boat or doing four-wheel drive across crazy terrain. Uh, If you want to see some video, I took some when I was there. It was crazy what they took us through. Um, But we would greatly rely on their aviation expertise, primarily helicopters, to get our missionaries into tribes in PNG. Um, They are an aviation training and testing and qualifying ministry. So they're more like the finishing of aviation. If you don't have any experience as a mechanic, you don't have any experience as a helicopter pilot, that's not where you go. After you've gotten some experience, when you meet their criteria, that's where you go. And they finish you off in all of the best ways possible. How are we partnering with them? Well, what I'm basically doing now is I'm not just recruiting churches. I'm not just recruiting missionary candidates to go. I'm recruiting helicopter pilots and mechanics. Um, If Finisterre indeed does try to send and does send new tribal teams each year, and a team is made up of two families at a minimum, then that means we're going to have in five to 10 years, 10 to 20 plus families in those mountains And I am going to put a burden on that current aviation ministry over in Papua New Guinea that they are simply not ready for. And so um, I'm trying to solve the crisis that I'm creating before it happens by recruiting pilots and mechanics. By recruiting helicopter pilots and mechanics uh, that JARS can test and qualify and then send to Papua New Guinea, that creates for our teams that we have there Um, aviation security. And I don't mean like TSA. I mean just it's secure. It's available. It's repeatable. It's reliable. It's dependable. It's going to get you in and out when you need. JARS is an amazing ministry. They have amazing leadership over them, and they are for some reason eager to have us um, investigate partnership with them as well. 
I want to tell you also now about <clears throat> some new churches in Texas that I'm developing partnership with. Um, one of them is Countryside Bible Church. It's familiar to some of you. Smed's mom has been there forever, right? How many years? Since 91. Many of you weren't even born then, were you? That's amazing. Um, Countryside Bible Church is in South Lake. It's in the Dallas area. They supported our tribal efforts originally with the Dodds and then with the Mitchells. And currently, what's interesting is they are helping us overcome the huge challenge that missionary house building or rebuilding um, presents. Um, your missionary, Grace Bible Church, the Cans, have been blessed greatly by this church and by, in particular, a family, uh, the Stewarts, Randy and Rachel Stewart. Um, they sent their son, Brett, uh, on one of the teams, and he stayed with them for about two months, or was it two months, I think, in um, P&G and helped just Zach do any of the building he needed to do. Um, and Brett's going to go back again uh, for a couple of months. And what this family wants to do on their own property in Texas is they want to build a missionary house, a full-scale missionary house, so that we can send our tribal teams to their, to their property and a, and, a, and a husband and a wife can look at this house and go, oh, that's what you're gonna, that's what I'm gonna live in. And a wife and a mom can get her head around that and start to be comforted perhaps or change expectations um, and all of that. We can carry out all of our off-grid technical training on that house, like how to wire solar panels how to do plumbing, how to do electricity. We can just do all of our training there. This is what this church wants to do. I, I, we need this. Finister has to have this kind of partnership. And so I'm developing something of a house building brain center so that everything that we do house building wise comes through that brain center so that we learn every time that we do it. So that by the time we build house five, six, seven, and eight, we've kind of learned some things. We've developed a well-worn path so Countryside Bible Church may even have also some personnel to add to our Medang base, our Medang team. That person has already visited Brian and been in Medang. Uh, and so I am going to Countryside in May for about eight days. I would just ask for you to pray for that partnership to just get solidified. I also have three more churches in the Dallas-Fort Worth area that I have appointments with and I'm meeting with. And one of those churches has a very strong aviation emphasis so there may be more pilots and or um, mechanics that could come out of that. Another church that I want to mention to you is Cornerstone Bible Church in Katy, Texas. That's the West Houston area. That is another church that has taken deep interest in Finisterre. Uh, Pastor Darren Roberts is there. He is um, from the mothership uh, in Jupiter, Florida uh, for our Expositors Seminary Network. Served under Jerry Rag for many years. He has been there and planted that church. That church is just over two years old. As a church plant, there's about 500 people in that church. And I don't know how much you know about Houston, but it is a, an international city. And in this one church, they have 40 different ethnicities. Um, and this church loves the nations, and they get it. And they have already begun supporting Finisterre itself, and there's a group of men there also that are strategizing how to build a missionary house that won't come down in an earthquake. Um, all I had to do is sit in a room with them and show them pictures of a helicopter sling loading lumber in. And they saw the damage to the houses and they start sending me drawings and asking me what kinds of materials are available. Um, when I was there recently, I was taken into a room and I was drawn on the whiteboard springs that we can put on the posts that the houses are on so that the house, the, the ideas these guys are coming up with are, are really amazing. And it's actually humbling and it's, it's stunning to see churches like this want to just leap into our path and want to join arms for this unfinished command in Papua New Guinea. And all of this potential in Texas, it, it leads to my last point, number four, just the implications on Kim and me. Um, again, just the, the number of churches to explore partnership with in Texas is, is overwhelmingly encouraging. 
And as I have prayerfully considered how best to cultivate those partnerships, the conclusion that I've come to is that I actually need to be closer to those partnerships, to those churches. Being closer to them, um, Kim and I believe, will actually make us better senders for churches. And it just so happens on a parallel track with that, as I've watched these partnerships develop, that one of those very churches has invited us to, to just join their membership, and that's Cornerstone Bible Church in Katy, Texas. And as Pastor Darren and the church have taken on supporting us, they would like Finisterre to be closer connected to them. And so the president will be moving there, um, Lord willing, around August 1, and he'll be taking his wife, right? She's going, just want to confirm that. She's coming. Yes. And the impetus for this move is, is Finisterre and the strategic partnerships that must be explored there. And I just want you to know, I, I'm so excited for the opportunity that is before Kim and me to take advantage of. But pray for Kim and me because excited is, is not the word that comes to mind when we think about the distance that we're going to put between us and Sydney and Jace and Elissa and Clay and little Levi and another grandbaby coming June 22nd. Um, but we both have counted the cost and are counting the cost, and, and we trust the Lord's next step for us. We do. And we have much to do right now to get our, our house ready, to finish well here, to finish well with our kids, and to create a new strategy for our relationship with our kids. I was thinking the other day, it, you really set yourself up for um, heartache when you actually live in the same place, like within 15 minutes of your kids and your grandkids. I, I grew up three and a half hours away from my grandparents. And I remember the joy that it was to leave a small little town in Nebraska and drive to Denver and be with my, my grandparents. And I loved visiting them. And the idea that, that my grandkids might feel that way about coming to Katy, Texas is, is exciting. Um, it helps bring some sweetness to the bitterness of that. So we need to strategize on how to build our relationship with our kids with distance now. So you can pray for that. And of course, we're going to miss every single one of you immensely here. I have never grown more in my relationship with Jesus Christ than I have at this church. It's true. Do you remember in our church covenant, we just read it last week. Do you remember how it ends? Do you remember? And if we ever leave Grace Bible Church, we will what? We'll find another church and we'll join it. That's what we're going to do at Cornerstone Bible Church in Katy. Darren has been talking with me since last June about how I could use my gifts there, how Kim could have fruitful ministry there. Darren, interestingly, is the age now that I was when I came to Grace Bible Church in 2003. He doesn't have very many skinned knees yet. And I recognize the season of church ministry that they're in. And I remember the strains and the challenges that... Um, of the kind that Darren is experiencing even now and the chance to be able to encourage him and use our gifts there to build up the body there. That, that's, that's exciting for us. Cornerstone Bible Church in Katy has nine men enrolled in the Expositor Seminary. They travel over to the campus in North Houston. So I'll get a chance to pour into men like that. They are on their first steps of creating their missions ministry there, and I'll get to help shape that. Kim and I will get to join a home Bible study and connect our lives to those people there. Kim will immediately activate her question-asking ministry at Cornerstone Bible Church. They're not ready for that. I'm still trying to get ready for that ministry. <laughs> 
And perhaps, um, and Darren has slotted me for some pulpit fill already. Um, and, and that God would just reveal so many partnerships in Texas to pursue. And then at the same time, have one of those churches take interest in us. Um, to this extent, that's truly humbling and encouraging. And that's confirming. It's confirming. So just thank you, Grace Bible Church, for the irreplaceable role that um, you have with Finisterre and that you just have in my own life. And um, Lord, we're just so thankful for you. We're thankful to God for you. Um, so that is it. Kim and I will be here for, um, you know, through the end of July. And so we can get many more times with you. And uh, we're just thankful to be a part of this church. Why don't we close in prayer and we'll finish up. Oh, Father in heaven, you um, are the one who ordains our steps. The mind and the heart of man plans his way, but the answer of the tongue is from you. You direct the steps. And that is so comforting because our plans are flawed. They're full of holes. They are vaporous. But your steps for us that we take are never flawed. We may not like or understand where the next step is sometimes, but what we do know is that it is not a flawed step. Joseph could never say that the Lord caused him to take a misstep into a pit or Potiphar's house or prison or the palace in Egypt. He may not have understood it along the way, but it was perfect. It was perfect. So whether we make plans and we like to do that or whether we are afraid of making plans and we choose to not plan, you are always giving the answer and you are always directing the steps and we trust you for that. Lord, I know my friends here and my brothers and sisters, my fellow members of this church here, they, they know that personally in their own lives. They've seen you be flawless in the directing of their steps when their plans have been crazy. And we're just thankful for that, Lord. Thankful for the way that you lead. You are in control. And Lord, we just remind ourselves that however it is that you want us to serve in the Great Commission, you are the unrivaled king who is worthy of unwavering obedience to the ends of the earth. And I pray for my friends that maybe today might be an opportunity for them to reevaluate the way that they're engaged in that. And that, God, you would just raise up more churches, that you would raise up more servants, more church planters and translators who want to go, that you would raise up more helicopter pilots and mechanics who will make it possible for these last unreached language groups to finally hear in their own tongue the gospel of Jesus Christ and the word of God. Father, may you do that for the sake of your name, do it because you are worthy of it. And Lord, if somehow we can just play a small little part in that, we, we would rejoice. What an, what an unspeakable privilege it is to be your children. Lord, we love you and we need you. And we give thanks in Jesus' name. Amen.